Let's open it up for questions. Sir? Um, you, you talked about the shifts in, in management style and the way companies are grown. Um, do you see a corresponding shift in investment mentalities? Is there going to be a paradigm shift in how capital moves? Yeah. So in Silicon Valley, when my first when I started first teaching this, and my students said, Professor Blank, that's great, you know, so which VCs actually buy into this model? I would change the subject and say, Is that Bill Gates over there? And like, you know, charge the, and, and, but in the last couple of years in Silicon Valley, if you don't at least give lip service to the lean startup, you know, it, it's now at least in the valley part of the lexicon. Um, I'm not sure most of them actually understand what the heck it means. Um, but let me give you an example. Even for VCs who still require, maybe even in New York, uh, that's nice, but we want to see the business plan. Let me give you a, a for example. You could take this whole getting out of the building stuff and then translate it into business plan ease. And how I would do that is, instead of just saying we think the market is X, just imagine putting in writing, after talking to 175 customers and going from this idea to learning about this to learning about this, holy cow. Or imagine doing a standard VC pitch when they want to know opportunity and size and whatever. Slide one is, here's what we thought of day one. And every VC is ready to give you their opinion. But then you quickly go to slide two. But after talking to 43 customers, let me tell you where we ended up. Wow, that's kind of interesting. But have you thought about... Well, here's slide three, because here was the other 38 customers, and here's where we're at now. And by the way, we now have 1,500 paying customers. Oh, let me tell you, that changes the dynamic rather than just showing up with, here's my slide deck as a point in time, which is, well, everybody has an idea, right? My dog has an idea, but I don't fund them. What, what I'm really interested in about is, how much did you learn? And we now have a process for, and a way for you to communicate not only here's how much I learned, here's how I learned it, and by now the conversation is over here for the potential. It doesn't mean they're going to fund you. It means, wow, well, maybe I disagree with your conclusion and what you did with that data, but you sure went through that same process. I normally would have like, spent a couple hundred grand to get you there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. Next question. Hi. So, so you mentioned about the... Um, the lean silo. So essentially, it's a series of experiments to, to get them known. So does it mean that you de-emphasize the idea of a roadmap stage? So it's like, what I want to achieve in two years, what I want to achieve? No, no, not at all. Um, so every, every founder um, who's building something substantial needs a vision, right? I'm going to change the world, and the world's going to look like this in three years. Uh, the problem is, is that we confuse that vision um, uh, with hallucinations. Um, <laughs> so, you know, most of the time as a founder, the data says you're actually hallucinating, right? Um, in fact, in day one, a startup is nothing more than a faith-based enterprise uh, because all you have is a series of untested hypotheses. So uh, I've never, in fact, um, stopped looking for the prize. You know, there's a phrase called eyes on the prize. And that's what a founder needs to do is continually keep their eye on the prize but the experiments you're running are telling you, you, is that prize achievable? Is it the right prize, et cetera? And one of the things world-class founders are great at is reinventing history. Because as you'll get more data, you'll go, oh, oh, oh I was always aiming over here. You know? <laughs> oh, no, I was always aiming over here. You know? And then eventually, you'll get to the right target. So yes, you need a long-term view. Don't confuse these tactical, out of the building MVPs and pivots, et cetera, with the inability to focus on the long term. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So I always thought of all these activities I did tactically as just obstacles to remove to get to that prize. Thanks. This gentleman here. So entrepreneurship centers everywhere have, as part of their pedagogy, typically business plan competitions. Not anymore. Well, I was going to say, so what does what the ideal business model competition look like? Can you tell us how that works? Sure. So. Everybody knows business plan competition. It's actually a uh, um, it's actually a, a parade in bikinis for venture capitalists, right? I mean, you're parading around. Your, I mean, that's all it is. Um, and why I hate business plan competitions is they actually don't move the entrepreneur forward. That is, the work you're doing there. I, I, my contention is 90% of it is crap and not going to be able to be used when you're building a company. So what I'd rather doing is 
if you were going to spend time in a competition, why don't we have a competition that actually moves you towards the goal of building this company? And so I've been involved with a couple of them. The business model competition was just run at Harvard and um, uh, started by BYU. It'll be at Stanford next year. And a good number of schools are m moving away from business plan competitions. And in a business model competition, I want you to start with a set of hypotheses. And then I want to grade you uh, in, uh, in the competition on how much you've been learning and how many iterations and pivots and MVPs and customer feedback did you get? And I don't care if it's the right presentation, but it's the right amount of learning. It's just exactly what I teach you in the class at the NSF and the NIH, et cetera. So business model competition is based on how much did you learn to find a repeatable and scalable business model. Hey, isn't that what a startup's about? Does that answer the question? And, and so that to me is what, here, it's the exact same reason, I'm gonna say something heretical here, why, um, why business school cases are toxic to entrepreneurs. Anybody in, in the read business school cases, right? What? Uh, Dave was sitting at the window thinking about the problem, he, or <laughs> Sally was walking around the lake pondering the new VP. What the hell is that? Right? <laughs> Eventually, what we're going to teach for entrepreneurs is business model cases. We're going to say, you know, Dave's first view of his business model had this customer segment and this whatever, but he realized he needed to get out of the building and understand what, oh, and he got out and he discovered that that was no, and in fact, will take us through the journey of somebody actually getting smarter about the cases. Anybody want to be a business model case writer, send me an email. That's the next project I got going on. N not that business, not that cases are long for large corporations, but for startups, what the hell are we reading that for? And by the way, this is from somebody who taught them for five years before I realized, not in my classroom. Uh, does that answer the question? Okay. This gentleman here. Hey there. Um, my name is Brandon. I got an awesome email over the weekend welcoming me to uh, the UCSF uh, Lean Launchpad. Part of the Lead High School team. So very excited about that. Um, question for you is, what uh, what sold you on dedicating a whole bunch of your time to work in health sciences, and why did you decide to, to invest the time in UCSF? Um, so uh, Silicon Valley has this bizarre culture called the pay it forward culture. Any of you ever hear about this? Uh, so the pay it forward culture, and I, I got sucked into it because people did it to me, is when you're young, um, people will help you without asking for anything. That's the short version of it. And that it makes you socially committed and obligated to when, when and if you're successful and to give back to other people. The most famous pay it forward photo is a guy with hair down to his shoulders sitting with uh, uh, one of the co-founders of Intel, Robert Noyce, when Noyce was the combination of Gates and Zuckerberg and, you know, uh, um, and Eric Schmidt, that is in, when Intel was basically it for Silicon Valley, and this long-haired kid was just starting his company and he had found Noyce's phone number in Palo Alto phone book, called him cold. And the guy was so amused by this kid, he started mentoring him. And there's a photo just before this kid started a company called Apple with Steve Jobs. Johnny Noyce was mentoring Jobs through his career. So Noyce died. And, but the Valley has lots of these models. And so when I retired, you know, I guess I could have sat home and ate chocolates or did something. <laughs> like golf, I don't know. But um, part of the things we did besides, you know, the classic write a check for charitable stuff is try to figure out how to give back to our community. And um, and I urge all of you is that, you know, in any way you can at whatever level is when you have either the time or resources that um, what's great about this country is that people will help you without asking for something and then it's your turn to give back. And so in retirement, I think of teaching as the way I give back to my community, to my country, um, and uh, and so that's why I do it. I also was a public official in the state of California for six and a half years. I just retired from doing that as well. And so, uh, you know, I believe in public and private service. It's just a thing I do. But I, I have to tell you, I think um, you're in a country where I think you're obligated to do that without anybody holding a gun to you. Yeah. That's right in the front row. On that note, I mean, as a nonprofit person, historically and an MBA more recently, I 
feel you're centered around social entrepreneurship. I agree that there might be some problem there. Um, and yet you have this clearly sense of obligation to individuals and community and so on. So how do you, is it just that business has no necessary obligation to that and we should just have a good internal moral compass too? Or I don't no, know no, how no. So, so uh, listen, I, I've sat on a ton of nonprofit boards and it's my duty of look at very check writing. It's just the, um, uh, that uh, trying to do a business model for nonprofits usually finds them lying to themselves um, by who the customer segment is. Because in, in the end of the day, the customer segments are typically the largest donor, not the segment you think you're serving. Um, and so organizations that tend to be donor driven are not driven by the same metrics as business. And so it's really hard. I was chairman of Audubon California, I was on the Audubon National Board, I was on all the land trust boards in, in Northern California. It's just hard to um, figure out how to measure them um, in the same way you measure for-profit companies. And so for me, it isn't about whether nonprofits are good or not. It's about how to build the same set of metrics I'm holding the for-profits to. Does that answer your question? As to whether uh, uh, companies should be uh, socially conscious, of course they should, uh, though I remind uh, uh, my startups is that if I find you doing this, I will break your feet. Uh, <laughs> because uh, anytime you want to take your eye off the ball, you can do that. When I'm a larger profitable company, that's a different conversation to have. Um, and again, if I want to set myself at a competitive disadvantage, um, the industry and my competitors will help me do that. I think there's a bigger issue that large companies are, have, are responsible for actually making the world a better place, not a worse one. And so instead of fighting um, regulations, they should actually figure out how to move the playing field up rather than down, which down seems to be what they spent their lobbying on. But that's a separate conversation. Other questions? Okay, let's just take a couple more questions. What's the best question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll switch up and look at that. Best question. Way, 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 way in the back. Best question? Uh, my question is, uh, so you talk about uh, this culture of people who would like to fail, or not, would like to fail, but who, where, it's a, where it's okay to fail. Um, what characteristics, what like common denominator traits do they have um, that you can identify? Because there's a difference between people who fail and because they don't do something right, or they fail and they distract the information and move forward. So can you sort of just... I don't understand the question. <laughs> I guess my question is to describe the culture of people where it's okay to fail. No, there is no culture where it's okay to fail. There's no people. <laughs> You're asking for individual characteristics? There are no, there is no founder who likes to fail. And if there is, I don't want him in my building. Well, not the kind who likes to fail, but when you talk about a culture. That's different than an individual. Right. So what question are you asking? I'm asking about the, the, just the culture of, No, it's that, that, there is no culture of people who like to fail. There's a culture of an environment where failure is not the end of your career. Is that clear or not? Yeah, now I can argue. Okay. Okay, and I saw a question way over there, far left. We want to be inclusive of those who are on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the four years of service, the six and a half, and, and getting us tonight. Um, you gave a little advice earlier telling entrepreneurs when looking at funding options, um, whether or not they're seeing the same seed. My question is uh, for similar advice. As an entrepreneur, we only do it so many shops, and the people we're raising the capital from usually have many more investments. Um, my question is, what terms as an entrepreneur, it's twofold. What terms, as an entrepreneur, should we be careful of from our own sake? And what terms should we be careful of in early rounds that may um, scare off future rounds? You know, between, let's say, the, the angels and what things, um, when we go in front of the VC firm, do they not like to see? Great. Do we have a semester? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the good news is, um, what I remind my students is that there's more information out there um, than you could ever want on any subject. And your biggest problem now is to figure out how to develop a internal compass on how to take it. So let me answer this question for all 
Um, I have a website called steveblank.com. Okay, you've seen it? Some of you have seen it. There's a tab on the top, and now I'm going to answer your question, called Startup Tools. You should also take a look at it, because there's a category on top that says Founding Advice. If you click on that, you will get some great advice from about five or ten VCs on how to answer your specific question about things to look out for, and it will link you to all those answers. But at the end of the day, and this is a, a great question that you all need to process, there's now so much information on what to do at every step that unless you have an internal compass, you're going to be spun around 360 degrees because you could get advice on any axis you ask for. And so I'm going to say there's some great advice on the website, not by me, but by Fred Wilson and you know by Angel Co. and, and uh, Angel List, etc., uh, and which is actually going to answer your question. But in general, you all need to have a compass, even for the stuff I've been talking about tonight. It's just an opinion. It's not a fact until it actually matches some strategy you have, or you're going to go to another you know conference with someone else telling you 90 degrees. It, you can't run a, a startup or be a founder when it's like the world's you know, advice. This is very different than it was when I was an entrepreneur. The only way you got data was coffee, and you couldn't ingest all that caffeine to you know, get information of that continual rate. Now you guys are overwhelmed with potential advice. And so you, I, I keep want to just say again, it, the last person to actually use a loud voice and be funny isn't the person you should be listening to. The person you should be listening to is you, who's processing all this data. Is that a good place to end, or do we have one final plus the end? Oh, this woman has the last brilliant question that we'll make. I don't want it to be the last, but I do want to ask it, maybe. Okay. So, go ahead. Um, so, hello. Thank Hi. you. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times the work that you're doing with um, Oscar, Oscar, Oscar Walter. Alexander about Oscar the new sort of yeah. models of organization. Yeah. When are you going to tell us When that? we're done. <laughs> probably 2014. Um, you know, I was working on it and then got distracted with this um, life sciences thing, which I thought was uh, interesting and important. Corporations are, you know, have fun. But is that going to be like more processes, like the things you said about how to prevent so it's like a yeah. checklist? No, checklist will be, you know, a series of articles, maybe a book, maybe, a, you know, these guys do consulting, I don't do that. Um, but it really is a point of view of what's clearly converging in the enterprise that needs to change dramatically. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, that you're just seeing these symptoms all around is that, if, you know, you got a VP of innovation, but you still have the head of M&A and the head of R&D and the head of uh, P&L and, oh, and, but the board decided to make this acquisition that didn't tell anybody and, you know, what the heck is it? I'm sorry? Or you're talking about like how the, the org doesn't keep up with how... Right. It's the org. It's the strategy. It's right. the continuous innovation problem. Um, and how to deal with a, an organization. I, as I said, and, I, and I, I'll say it again, I think we're about to bifurcate into two different trajectories for companies. There's going to be the Amazon trajectory that will last for decades. And there'll be the shooting star trajectory where we put all our money in making the street happy on a quarter by quarter basis. And yeah, we're investing in R&D, but we're not really figuring out how to make this a continual process. And those are going to be five to 10 year companies. And the street might just be happy with one or another. But unless you understand what the role of um, investment in continuous innovation looks like and have made that an organizational construct, you're going to fail. And you're going to fail fairly rapidly. Um, and it's not only a technology business. Let me give you an example. Um, we used to think oil drilling was you punch a vertical hole in the ground and you know you pump oil out. And and you know in the last 20 years, the oil companies discovered oh, but you could put some smarts in the drill head and go horizontal for five or six miles. But that was it. That was the oil business. Well, it turns out about 15 years ago, someone said, yeah, but if you drill in shale and throw surfactants in, you could actually get you know what we call now fracking. But in fact, the U.S. is going to be energy independent in like another decade or two with all the intended environmental consequences. But you know what? It almost put Exxon out of business. If that would have continued, uh, they had to spend, what, $15 billion to acquire, who was it? Um, anybody remember who they acquired? Anyway, the, there was a huge disruption in a business you would have thought, it's oil. You just put a hole in the ground. How disruptive could that be? Boom. Or the, as I said, the auto companies. Hey, we 
make internal combustion engines. How, you know, that's never going to change. Set your watch. Um, so the answer is yes. I, I think we're going to come out with models on how companies can actually do that themselves. The antithesis of that is why bombers no longer working at Microsoft. Um, you know, those were the, that's kind of like a dinosaur where you actually killed the head, but the rest of the body never knew it. I mean, you know, um, there was so much organizational momentum, but it was a dead, and by the way, if you ever want to test those, the companies that don't have that innovation DNA, um, ask how many A students who are, you know, 20 years old, uh, just graduating from college, that's their first choice. I don't know anybody who's like going there, right? Um, and that's going to obviously going to change with whatever happens. That process needs to change. All right. Steve, I think uh, we are at the end. This has been a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.